Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for the opportunity this evening. As Tim said, this is a, uh, it's a very personal topic for me. Um, so let me begin by, uh, by looking at this. What did I do? <laughs> there we go. This passage from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it's a familiar passage too, I would imagine. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And uh, it would be hard to overestimate how profoundly those words have affected uh, Western civilization. Um, as they appear uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, you know, in the ancient world, the idea that uh, human beings were created in the image of God or the gods only extended to certain people. So Pharaoh was the image of Ra. And uh, later in the Roman Empire, uh, some of the, uh, some of the, the um, uh, emperors were seen to be gods. But what the scriptures say is that human beings... Uh, democratically across the board are made in the image of God. Uh, and as that biblical doctrine of man being created in the image of God uh, began to take hold in the, in the church and in the Western world in the uh, Roman Empire, it had profound effects. Um, you know, in most of the, uh, of the world's history and uh, certainly in the Greco-Roman world, uh, up to that time, uh, slavery, for example, was, was pretty common. Uh, but as that idea of human beings created in the image of God took hold, the institution of slavery uh, began to, to disappear. And so, it's working here. So, yeah, so, um, so as we think about that, the profound effects uh, of those words on Western civilization, the question arises, uh, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Uh, we read those words and we understand that uh, it affords dignity to human beings, uh, but what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And that's the kind of things that, uh, that, that theologians will reflect on. Uh, when I was a divinity student at Westminster Seminary, uh, in the early 1990s, I was required to take a course entitled The Doctrine of Man. And that was a three credit course, which meant that for uh, 15 weeks, for three hours a week, I sat in a class and listened to lecture on what it meant for human beings to be made in the image of God. Um, for about 10 hours a week, uh, over 15 weeks, I read books and periodicals and journals by theologians about what it meant to be made in the image of God. And um, I took a couple of exams and wrote a few papers on that. And uh, the result of that was that I felt like I had a pretty good handle of what it meant for human beings to be made in the image of God. Um, if you look at the history of theology, theologians have... Um, approach the doctrine of the image of God in, uh, in, in basically three ways. And um, the, the first of those ways, probably the earliest, is what we might call the substantive approach to the doctrine of the image of God. Um, and, and that was to say that the image of God was seen to um, consist of those non-physical qualities that we see within man. So they would speak of the soul uh, or the mind or reason uh, or the uh, uh, coordinate things with that, creativity, uh, intellect. And um, largely what those theologians did was they approached the question by seeking to answer what's unique about human beings. When you look at human beings and you look at the rest of animate creation, what makes human beings different from the animals? And as we see those differences, we can see uh, the image of God. So about uh, 360 uh, AD, uh, the great Cappadocian father, Basil, wrote, um, in what is the ruling principle? It is the superiority of, superiority of reason. 
What is lacking in strength of body is encompassed by the employment of reason. For I have that which is according to the image in being a rational being. And, uh, and so the idea there is that the image of God is to be found in rationality and our reasonable faculties. Um, now, you know, it's interesting that, uh, that, that after the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century, uh, the so-called age of reason, um, when human beings, when man tried to uh, uncouple knowledge from the knowledge of God, and they put a great deal of emphasis on, region, on um, reason, the, the church followed suit and, uh, and doubled down on this idea that the image of God, many theologians did, that the, that the image of God is to be found in, in reason. And so as recently as uh, 1989, a theologian uh, by the name of Philip Edgecombe Hughes wrote, uh, because he is the image of God, man differs in radical manner from the rest of animate creation. In the surpassing excellence of personality, spirituality, rationality, authority, and creativity. Uh, so one way of looking at the image of God in an early way was to look at the image of God substantively. That the image of God is something uh, in man, some non-tangible quality, the soul, the mind, the intellect uh, in man. A second way of looking at the image of God was to uh, look at the image of God functionally. Uh, that the image of God consists in the tasks that human beings are called to do and enabled to do in their creation. And uh, those who uh, gravitated toward this functional understanding of the image of God would look at uh, Genesis 127, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so those who look at the image of God functionally uh, would say that, that the image of God is to be found in the functions that God has called man to carry out, uh, the so-called cultural mandate. Uh, recently, a, uh, an Anglican theologian by the name of Thomas Smale uh, wrote, reflecting on the image of God, he said, so to be in the image and likeness of the Father, there are to be areas of life where we are proactive to intervene in situations and accept responsibility for turning them in directions that they would not otherwise take. The image of the Father is the image of the leader. And so what Smale has in mind is that in the, in the creation, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. It was a chaos. And God intervened in that chaos, and he formed it into a cosmos. And uh, Smale says that, uh, that, that to be in the image and likeness uh, of the Father, there are areas of life then where we're to be proactive and intervene in situations and accept responsibility for turning them in, in the directions that they would not otherwise take. Uh, so theologians have seen the image of God uh, substantively, uh, they've seen it functionally, and uh, lastly, uh, theologians uh, looked at the image of God relationally. Now, kind of the wellspring of this uh, relational uh, understanding of the image of God uh, comes from uh, Karl Barth in the 1930s and 40s in uh, his massive tome, uh, Church Dogmatics. Uh, there's a, a couple of volumes there on the creation, and there uh, Bart discusses the image of God. And uh, what Bart says is he looks at the text and looks at the history of theology. Uh, Bart says that the image of God is not to be found in an analogia entis, in a, an analogy of being, but rather in an analogia relationis, in an analogy of relationship. And Bart uh, reasoned this way because uh, God is eternally triune, that's what God is in his being, that the image of God is to be found in relationship, that, uh, that, that God has always existed before the creation of the world as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and because of that, um, the image of God is to be found in relationality. And, and Bart thought that that was uh, seen right on the surface of the text. He alluded to Genesis 127 that says, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
and Bart said that that, that, that latter uh, phrase, male and female, he created them, is the explanation of what it means to be created in the image of God. And so Bart spoke a great deal about the, the I-thou relationship, that God eternally exists in this relationship of I-thou, that while there's one God, uh, that that God exists in three distinct persons. And so the Father uh, speaks of I to the Son, thou, or to the Spirit, thou. The Son speaks as I to the Father, thou, or the Spirit, thou. And the Spirit speaks as I to the Son, thou, and to the Father, thou. And so the image of God is to be found in relationship. Now, you know, you look at those uh, three approaches and... Um, the substantive and functional uh, were very early approaches, and, uh, and they play out throughout the history of theology uh, on the doctrine of the image of God. And the question always is, you know, which of these is, is the right way to look at it? And the conclusion that I came to, I think a lot of modern theologians uh, have come to, is that uh, this is not a competition. These are aspects, the way of looking at, this, uh, at the same thing. And you can look at this doctrine from various aspects. You can uh, look at it from the aspects of the capacities of human being, the, uh, the intellect, reason. You could look at it in terms of human beings' functionality and their call uh, of the things that they're to do in the world. And you can look at it in terms of uh, relationship. And I think that all of them have value uh, and all of them are beneficial to consider. Um, you know, everybody's a theologian, and that's really true. Everybody is a theologian, and all Christian people are Christian theologians. Because what you need to do in order to do theology is you need to read this book, right? And then you need to look at the world around you and, and figure out how this book fits, what it means, how it helps us to interpret the world around us. And... Um, and when we do that, then, we, we formulate hypotheses as the way we think that this book interacts with the world around us. And our hypotheses are going to be conditioned by and limited by our experiences. What all of these uh, approaches to the image of God uh, have in common and historically uh, had in common is that the image of God is seen to consist in those uh, attributes and abilities that separate us from the animals. That's a pretty consistent approach, that the image of God is to be found in those, uh, those abilities, uh, those, uh, those attributes that separate us from the animals. And I you know, went into my ministry understanding the image of God as well as anybody does, I suppose, and then uh, something happened in 2001. In 2001, uh, my daughter Rebecca was born. And at about eight months old, Rebecca would uh, begin to have seizures that required hospitalization to get under control. She spent many, many weeks um, in the hospital till we were able to get them under control somewhat. She still is plagued by seizures. And uh, as time went by, Rebecca was given a clinical diagnosis of something called Angelman syndrome. Now, Angelman syndrome will uh, present in different people in different ways. There are similarities. That's why it's a, a, a syndrome. But let me tell you about Rebecca rather than uh, just about her syndrome and, and some of the things uh, that characterize Rebecca's life. R Rebecca cannot speak. She can't utter a single word. And as far as we can tell, Rebecca doesn't understand any language. And she understands her name. She'll stop and turn and look at you if you say her name. And she understands no. If she's reaching for something and you say no, she'll stop. But as far as we can tell, those are the only two things that Rebecca understands. Um, she's impulsive. You can't leave her alone with food or anything uh, else that she wants, which is pretty much just food. Um, She's unable to take care of her own basic needs. She can't dress herself. She can't bathe herself. She can't change herself. She can't toilet herself. She'll never calculate a math problem. She'll never read a book. She'll never write a sentence. She'll never hold any kind of a job, and she'll never uh, live on her own in any way. Um, Rebecca seldom seeks the attention or interaction of other people. She does sometimes. 
uh, in the bottom right-hand corner that was taken this past Christmas, and she's smiling because I'm tickling her. But, but if you look at her eyes, her eyes aren't quite looking at me. And uh, for a lot of her life, Rebecca lives kind of uh, in her own world. And uh, for the rest of her life, she'll be dependent on others uh, to care for her, to get her food, to bathe her, to change her, to dress her, to toilet her. Uh, Rebecca doesn't know whether she's dressed or not. If we didn't put clothes on her, she would walk around without them. Uh, she has no sense of danger. We couldn't allow her to walk around outside by herself. She'd walk out in the road and have absolutely no sense of danger. Um, my other daughter, Caitlin, uh, has a Beagle Jack Russell mix, Ruby. R Ruby's a smart dog. Uh, Ruby knows come, sit, beg, jump. And um, Ruby knows not to touch food that she's not supposed to touch if we're looking. <laughs> and if she gets into something like the trash, which she knows she's not supposed to, and would never do it if we're there, but if we're out and she gets into the trash, she has some time we come home and the, and, the, and the trash is spread all over the place, Ruby's nowhere to be found. She's hiding because Ruby has what looks to be a kind of a sense of shame or guilt or something like that. But Rebecca doesn't exhibit any of those things. And about um, 14 years ago, when, uh, when my wife was out and I was home with my daughter watching her, um, watching her just sit, uh, she's got some very autistic-like behavior, so she had a little people's truck in her hand and she was just spinning it around. And I was watching her and uh, just sitting there thinking, and I thought back to my theological training and I had a thought occur to me that filled me with horror. And the thought was, my daughter does not bear the image of God. And I thought to myself, that can't be right. But my theological paradigm was inescapable. Uh, if the image of God consists in things like language and reason and the ability to create, uh, the ability to exercise authority or dominion in marriage or uh, or um, intricate interpersonal relationships, Rebecca has none of those things, and she will not for the rest of her life. Now, I didn't like that conclusion, but it was the inescapable conclusion of my theological paradigm. And what, what I found as I began to look into that question is that I wasn't alone in making it. So I think probably everybody here uh, tonight knows this fellow, right? Um, Martin Luther uh, started a bit of a ruckus in 1517, right, by, by nailing uh, his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg, and, and sparked off by that event, but what followed was the, the Protestant Reformation, and uh, Luther is credited, and he should be credited, with uh, restoring the idea of the church being under the authority of the scriptures, of the word of God. Um, he brought out for the church the idea that we're justified by grace through faith, apart from any merits on our part. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, be uh, too, uh, too harsh on, on Dr. Uh, Luther here. Uh, he's rightly healed, uh, hailed as a hero, but... Um, but he said some things that were very unsettling about those who had severe disabilities. And, uh, and so when, when one time he was speaking with some of his, uh, his uh, students, his colleagues, these are recorded in, his, uh, in those works table talk that were uh, recorded about uh, Luther's discussions with some of his students. Uh, they were talking about uh, people with, uh, with disabilities, born with disabilities, severe disabilities, and uh, Luther opined that, that, that they should not be baptized because I hold that they're only animal life. Uh, there was another case of a, um, of a young boy a, uh, a couple towns over um, who, for the people who study those things, as they looked at the symptoms as they're described, it's uh, hard enough, I think, to diagnose these things. 
uh, in person. Harder, I think, 500 years later, right? But some people who study these things uh, think that the, that the boy in question may have had something called Prader-Willi syndrome. And, um, <clears throat> and they were talking about this boy, and they said uh, that, uh, that, that he eats as much as four farmers. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's a characteristic of Rebecca, too. We've got a lock on the refrigerator because she would, she would be like a goldfish. She would just eat until she... Uh, she, she couldn't eat anymore. And, um, and, and uh, so this, this, uh, this young boy ate as much as four farmers, and, uh, and he didn't do anything to help out around the house. As all he could do was eat, sleep, and excrete. And Luther opined that the boy should be suffocated because he was a lump of flesh without a soul. And... Um, you know, let's be too hard on Dr. Luther. If you look at the way the doctrine of the image of God is formulated as consisting in these things, this is the logical conclusion. We might not like where the logical conclusion leads, but it's the, it's the logical conclusion. And Luther was being consistent with the history of the theology of the image of God. Um, there's a fellow in the Netherlands, his name is uh, Hans Reinders, he's a theologian and an ethicist. He also works with uh, intellectually uh, challenged people. And, uh, and, and Reinders uh, said this, he said, when I first began thinking of this problem, that is how to view and include those with cognitive disabilities, he said, my intuitive response as a Christian theologian was that the Christian tradition could easily handle it because of the doctrine of the imago Dei, of the image of God. When I started to explore this question, however, it soon became clear that the Christian tradition might have been one of the major sources of the problem. And um, and so I began to, uh, to, to, to think that we need to rethink what it means to be made in the image of God. And I'll tell you that, as I said before, that uh, theology is done by reading the scriptures and then looking at the world around us and forming hypothesis. And what happened until very recently is that uh, people like Martin Luther and a lot of people didn't come into contact with people like Rebecca. They came into contact with typical people. Uh, when I was forming my doctrine, my understanding of the image of God, uh, I was in a theological seminary with a bunch of people who sat around and uh, we're learning Greek and Hebrew and uh, learning the uh, th reading theology and philosophy and history. Well, of course, it made sense to think that the image of God had to do uh, with the intellect. Um, I think the reason why it matters uh, what the church thinks, you know, some people would say, what does it matter what the church thinks? Because increasingly the church has less influence in our society. Uh, but it was the spread of Christianity and the uh, image of God doctrine that elevated and bestowed uh, dignity on all people in the first place. Not just kings and important people, but all people. And, uh, and, and that and that carried through, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, as, uh, as, as countries began to become wealthy, the Western world began to care for those who were intellectually disabled, uh, for the uh, imbeciles, idiots, and morons, as they called them. Now, those words sound very derogatory to us, but at one time those were medical terms, and they had specific meanings. And so institutions were created. Some of them were not very pleasant places. But there was an attempt to care uh, for those who, um, uh, who, were, um, uh, who, who had intellectual disabilities and who couldn't care for themselves. Uh, that was so uh, in the US, it was so in, um, in, uh, in, in Europe. And at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, um, the war to end all wars occurred, right? And, um, and, and that war, at the, uh, uh, when it was concluded, uh, after the armistice was concluded with the, uh, with the Treaty of Versailles, and I'm not going to go too much into history here, but um, uh, a couple features of the Treaties of Versailles was that Germany had to disarm, and the other was that it had to pay reparations to, uh, to, to France and to England. And um, the result of that, because of uh, how the Weimar Republic uh, uh, handled that, 
was that people were dispirited, which, uh, which, which seldom makes for good productivity. And, uh, and, and, um, and they were impoverished. And you know, there's those famous pictures of people bringing basketfuls of francs uh, to buy bread with. Now, now you see, here's the, here's the difficulty, right? When, when you have to work that hard just to put bread on the table, um, it's human nature to be a little resentful that I have to pull off a piece of that bread, literally or figuratively, and hand it to someone who will gulp it down greedily, who doesn't work for that, doesn't contribute, and, um, and may not even be grateful about where it came from. They might not even realize the, the hard work of, uh, of, of, where that, uh, of where that came from. Um, well, you, you know that uh, that, that war was, uh, was uh, not the war to end all wars. Um, uh, Adolf Hitler became uh, chancellor of, uh, of Germany. Um, he was popular with the people because he, he wanted to restore Germany to its greatness. And um, he wanted to do that partially by uh, making sure that the race was pure. Um, Hitler uh, was, was very influenced uh, by a number of people's ideas, but by the ideas of Charles Darwin. And, uh, and so uh, we're all familiar uh, with the Holocaust and the extermination of, uh, of six million Jews, but the, uh, but the extermination of the six million Jews really had a, a precursor, a test run, in something called the T4 Euthanasia Program. And, um, and, uh, and, and what happened is that Hitler and the Nazis began to look around at those in society, an impoverished society that was trying to rebuild, and uh, looked at people who were contributing nothing economically to the culture, uh, looking at people who would, uh, would, would consume resources, and sometimes, because of their condition, more resources than typical people might. And they began to refer to such people as useless eaters as inferior, as subhuman, as life, unworthy of life. Um, and so that, uh, that, that T4 euthanasia uh, program became an open secret. Um, under it, um, people who were institutionalized, you know, their families would just get a letter. So sorry to inform you that your son, your daughter, your brother uh, has, has died. But they didn't die. They had been murdered. And, uh, and, and there were about 200,000 people of all ages with disabilities who were murdered under the T4 euthanasia program. Um, even after it was rescinded, and it was pretty quickly uh, after it was started, um, officially rescinded, uh, but, um, but it's estimated that 75,000 to another 100,000 uh, people were murdered passively by the withholding of medical treatment or medicine or food and water. And, um, and as I said, it was an open secret that, uh, that, that people knew that it was happening. They didn't, they didn't object much. And, you know, you look at that and you say, well, well what about the churches? You know, where, where were the churches in all of this? Because uh, Germany was a Lutheran country. It had a, uh, a, a, a rather sizable Roman Catholic minority. And, uh, and, and to be sure, uh, we know of some people in the minority and uh, those who made up uh, what came to be called the Confessing Churches, who signed the, um, the theological uh, statement at Barman called the Barman Declaration. Uh, probably the most famous of those is a fellow by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But the reason why Bonhoeffer is, um, is heroic, is lionized, why he's courageous is because he stood alone against a whole society. Now, not actually alone, there were other people who were with him, but he was in the minority. Uh, the, the majority sided with a movement in Germany called the Deutsch Christian Movement, the German Christian Movement, that, uh, that, that uh, had at the, at the head of it um, a Reich bishop by the name of uh, Ludwig uh, Mueller. And uh, Ludwig Mueller would often speak of positive Christianity as opposed to the negative Christianity that had come before that saw 
care for the poor and uh, things that would put society at a disadvantage. And so what, uh, what, what uh, Ludwig Mueller said was, uh, he said, our Christianity is based on love, but it's a love, he said, that has a hard warrior-like face. It hates everything soft and weak because it knows that all life can then remain healthy and fit for life when everything antagonistic to life, the rotten and indecent, is cleared out of the way and destroyed. You hear a statement like that and you see what happens and you think, you know, how could churches and Christian people have allowed or, e or even approved of such barbarism? And I think there's two reasons. One, that the society that they lived in had conditioned them because there was a propaganda com campaign um, that created a, a general disdain for people who took without giving, who were useless eaters. And then uh, some of those shocking statements by the great reformer Martin Luther, who was a hero in Germany, well, those might have been uh, buried to history, except that they were discovered and unearthed by the Nazis, and uh, those statements by Luther were repeated in the churches oftentimes on Sundays. And the, the church in Germany's belief in the predominant traditional image of God doctrine uh, left little defense for people who didn't fit the image of God criteria. In other words, here's the criteria for being made in the image of God, and these people don't fit that criteria. And the economic hardship that the German uh, people were, were facing and feeling the crunch of uh, allowed them to justify eliminating people who took more than the average share of economic resources and contributed nothing economically in return. I think it's for that reason that we need to reconsider the doctrine of the image of God. Now, when I say that, am I suggesting that we uh, do away with or upend or throw away 2,000 years of Christian theology? I think it's never safe to do that. But I'd like to suggest that in formulating the doctrine, the, the church throughout history, at least in her language, uh, has discovered the right pieces, but she's assembled them backwards. And um, if, if you read a lot of the theologians, you, you get the idea that it looks uh, something like this, that you've got, um, that you've got uh, uh, intangible qualities of human beings, uh, uh, reason, logic, the soul, uh, language. Uh, you've got functional things that human beings are able to do and called to do that uh, differentiate them from the animals. And you've got uh, these relational things about human beings. You know, animals may mate, but human beings marry. And upon all those things rests what it means to be made in the image of God. And that's the idea that you get if you read many of the, the theologians. What I'd like to suggest to you is that the paradigm really ought to look more like this. That the image of God is at the foundation and all of those other things, uh, language, logic, rationality, creativity, uh, the tasks that we do, uh, human relationships, that all those things grow out of our being made in the image of God. Um, so we don't need to throw out all the theology of the past, but I think that we need to flip the paradigm. Uh, the abilities and capacities of human beings are not the criteria by which we judge whether or not people are made in the image of God, but those things are the consequent of being made uh, in the image of God. And, you know, so as we look at that language then, uh, with that idea, um, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And that language uh, is, is so common in Western society that we don't think about those words, really. Uh, let us make man in our image. It's a strange phrase, really, if you think about it, in our image. What, what exactly uh, does that mean? Um, you know, there's some theologians who approach this uh, substantively, and they'll speak about the, the image of God in man, that the image of God is some quality uh, that resides in mankind. Well, it's quite different to say that the image of God is in man, and man is made in the image of God. But what does it mean to say that man is made uh, in the image of God? And without getting into a lot of, uh, of detail of, uh, of Hebrew grammar here, um, Hebraists such as David Klein's, but there have been others as well, 
uh, who have pointed out that really a better way to translate that is let us make man as our image. That in other words, uh, when, when God speaks about his intention to create human beings, uh, he's talking about making those human beings as his image. And, um, and then, then we, as we look at that, God said, let us uh, make man uh, as our image, according to our likeness. And the a word that's used there is the Hebrew word uh, tselem. It's a word that occurs 17 times uh, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And um, that word, if you look at its usages outside of, uh, of uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 5, chapter 9, so you're looking at those places where we might define it, what you find is that the word selim uh, always refers to a three-dimensional figure representing something that is invisible, either because the original is not currently present or because it's intrinsically invisible. So uh, in the ancient world, kings would sometimes, when they conquered a land, set up a selim, an image of themselves. And what that would do, then when they went back to wherever it was that they came from, would be a tangible reminder to the conquered people that they were under uh, his authority and his rule. Uh, or the, the images uh, that are made of the, of the gods, of Baal and, and, uh, and other gods, uh, were tselamim, were, uh, were images that represented the gods which were uh, understood to be intrinsically uh, invisible. And, and so it emerges uh, as you uh, look at this, is that the whole human being, not just something uh, in man or some ability that he possesses or some part of him, his soul or something like that, but the entire human being is constituted the image of God. And, uh, and, and rationality, uh, relationality, function, those things grow out of their consequent of being made in the image of God. They're not the criteria by which we judge whether people uh, are made uh, in the image of God. Um, it's, the question that arises is what do we do with people who don't exhibit those things? Like my daughter, Rebecca. And it's at that point, I think, that we need uh, to not shy away from, uh, not be embarrassed by, and, and take seriously the doctrine of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 and the, and the disaster that happened when man rebelled against God. And in doing that, he created an animosity, an enmity between himself and God, between himself and other human beings, uh, and between himself and creation. And you know, the reality uh, is, when you think about the image of God here, Oh, well, let me, let me just talk about this a little bit here. Um, so, so let me just back up for a minute here because I lost my place in the, in the, uh, in the slides here. Um, then God said, uh, let us make man as our image according to our likeness. Okay, and, and, then, and then there's a consequential conjunction. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want you to see is that the foundational condition is God's declaration, let us make man as our image according to our likeness. Those other things then result from that and let them rule over the fish of the sea uh, and, the, uh, and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle. And then it talks about God fulfilling that. And God created man as his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's the condition. And then the consequent of that, uh, we've got the, the consequential conjunction, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So, so you see there that the, that, the, that the condition is God creating human beings in his uh, image, and these things being a consequent. And so then let me ask the question, what about people who don't exhibit these consequences? And what I'd like to suggest to you is that if we take Genesis chapter 3 uh, seriously, what, what we'd understand is that the image of God, which is what God has created us to be, um, has its outworkings which have been damaged because of the fall. And the reality is, is that the image of God in all of us has been damaged. See, not just people with disabilities, all of us have been damaged uh, as the image of God. Now, 
you don't see that so much because the damage that you've sustained is not very different from mine. And, and we call ourselves typical. And we, we recognize different kinds of damage, damage that's not typical uh, to what we're used to. But if we take Genesis chapter 3 uh, seriously, um, we've all suffered damage. We're all broken, but in uh, different ways. And uh, restoration of the image of God and completion of it is going to come in Christ. That's what the gospel is about, that God sent his son into the world. And as we, you know, the, the language of uh, the image of God, it ends in Genesis chapter 9. It's never picked up again in the Hebrew Bible, but it's picked up in spades in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul and others, who speaks about the image of God, and particularly uh, with Christ as the, uh, as the image of God. And, uh, and so Christ in his incarnation comes as the untainted image of God um, into this creation. And in his resurrection and glorification, he reaches the apex of the image of God that we were created to share in. And so the scriptures tell us in uh, Colossians 1.15, and he is the image of the invisible God that's speaking of his incarnation. He's the visible image of the invisible God. Uh, the firstborn of all creation is speaking now of his resurrection, that Christ is the start of the new creation, that the creation is to be conformed to him. He's the first fruits of it. And so we're told in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, um, if anyone is in Christ, he's new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 47 through 49, Paul writes, The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so, are also, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy man, we shall also bear the image of the man who is from heaven. And, and so what the New Testament scriptures indicate to us, well, let me read this passage from 1 John 3, 2. Uh, Beloved, now we are the children of God. In the scripture, the idea of being the children of God and being the image of God are, are sister images. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. What that means is that all human beings are made as the image of God. It also means that all human beings are damaged in that image. And we just don't recognize the damage in ourselves and people like us because it's typical damage. You know, what's the old saying that uh, in, the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king? Right, that we're all walking around with one eye and we think we're normal. Right, and so the value of human beings is not to be found in the outward manifestations of the image of God, but the value is the value that's bestowed upon us in our creation by our Creator, um, regardless of the damage. So, um, you know, this is a, uh, a statue of the, of the Phoenician god Baal. The, um, the archaeologists who discovered this must have been ecstatic to find a statue that well intact, right? Um, but imagine they'd come across a statue. I had no way of really doing this better than this. And the statue looked like that. Would they still be able to recognize that that was Baal? They'd still be able to recognize that that was, that that was Baal. Does it matter that his, that his cone head is broken off? Does it matter that his upraised uh, hand throwing lightning bolts broken off or his legs are broken off? People would still recognize that as an image of Baal. They wouldn't say this used to be an image of Baal. Um, or to give an example used by, uh, by David Kilner in his book, uh, Dignity and Destiny, um, how much is that coin worth? 25 cents. How much is that coin worth? 25 cents. Um, the fact that this is shiny and new and pristine uh, and that is uh, old and defaced doesn't change the value of it because 
the, the value is assigned to it uh, by, the, by the minters of it. So let me, let me talk then in conclusion about, um, about why this matters. You, you know, right now in the U.S., uh, there's, a, there's a lot of compassion for and a lot of uh, resources expended on those who have disabilities. My daughter benefits from that. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is the, is the relative wealth that we experience. People are disposed to be generous. It makes them feel good about themselves um, when they have extra. If things were to ever change, if we were to ever enter a depression again, or things became like they were in Germany, um, I really have no doubt that people with disabilities would become dehumanized because they always historically have been. And it matters because the church needs a sound understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God so that in difficult times, the church won't clasp hands with the culture in devaluing people for the good of society, such as many Christians and many earnest Christians in Germany did in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, it's, the, it's the task of the church, as the church, to preach the gospel of Christ and to promote the kingdom of God, the lordship of Christ. And the church, as the church, really legitimately endeavors itself in, in no other uh, business. But, you know, as we do that, as we seek to do that, hopefully bring people into the kingdom, um, we need to remember that Jesus said that the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many people go that way, and the unconverted will always be with us. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And, uh, and so there are people to whom, you know, these ideas really aren't going to matter. Um, I don't know if you recognize this man. It's a man by the name of uh, Peter Singer. He teaches ethics at Princeton University. And um, Singer has recognized the importance of the doctrine of the image of God for human dignity. He said this, human beings are here, meaning in uh, Genesis uh, 3, or I'm sorry, in Genesis 1, uh, human beings are here seen as special because they alone of all living creatures were made in the image of God. But Singer's not a believer. And he says, with the disproof of the Hebrew myth of creation, the belief that human beings were specially created by God in his own image was also undermined. And Singer draws a uh, logical conclusion from that. He says, if we can put away these emotionally moving but strictly irrelevant aspects of the killing of a baby, we can see that the grounds for not killing persons does not apply to newborn infants. In other words, what, what Singer says is this, that, and, and this sounds like the, like the, like the Roman Empire before uh, Christianity took hold there, that Singer said, let's put away this nonsensical argument. We're talking about abortion, for example, of whether fetuses in the womb are human beings. Of course they're human beings, but we shouldn't regard them as persons. And he said, in order to be a person, and he uh, takes this criteria, I think, somewhat arbitrarily, but he says, in order to be a person, uh, you have to have a sense of continuity and a hope of being there tomorrow. And a fetus doesn't have that, so they're not to be regarded as a person, and you can kill them. A newborn baby doesn't have that, and so they're not to be regarded as a person, and you can kill them. And my daughter Rebecca does not have that, so she is not to be regarded as a person, and she could be killed if it served the interests of society. Um, so what can we do? Well, I think first of all, the church, as the church, can develop and maintain a clear understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God so as to protect the most vulnerable members of our race and have the conviction to resist their removal if that's ever suggested. That, that we need to have a clear understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God and not to see it as uh, something based on some criteria of, uh, of intellect or uh, creativity or relationality uh, or whatever it might be. Um, but as I said before, the church as the church really only legitimate 
constantly uh, engages in the promotion of the kingdom of God. Uh, but Christian people, that's you, right, in your specific callings, uh, in the mandate that God's given you to go into the, uh, the world to subdue the earth, the so-called cultural mandate, um, Christian people can promote social, economic, and political structures that will minimize the danger posed to the most vulnerable people. And I just want to say thanks very much for letting me share that with you tonight. Thank you.